Hello YouTube viewers, welcome to my channel Science to Technology. In today's show, Rocket Monday, we're going to talk about rocket propellant tanks. So let's dive right into it. Now first we have to understand what exactly we are talking about. We are talking about something that handles basically fuel and oxidizer. These are two different things and that's why it's technically not called a fuel tank simply because you have an oxidizer also. And that's 90 plus percentage of rocket. Basically at bare minimum 90% of rocket would be uh, basically quote unquote propellant or uh, generally it's 95%. So you get the idea. Whenever you are looking at a rocket, 99% of the time you are just looking at a basically tank. These are flying tanks basically. Now propellant tanks have to hold uh, what we classify as uh, a lot of things in two separate categories. Basically they cannot mix these things. The mixing must happen in the engine. It cannot happen beforehand. And that's especially a problematic thing if uh, those two things are self-igniting. Basically you touch them, it goes boom. You really want to make sure that you don't accidentally quote unquote mix them. So you have to understand this aspect about fuel tank that they handle dynamic and changing mass because it's a liquid it's not a solid it's not like solid rocket motor it's not gonna burn evenly it has a liquid it's gonna move around so it's a basically changing things and because you are draining it fundamentally your tank weight is changing your tank weight will start let's say at 600 ton it could easily start to go to like let's say 500 ton by the time it's only few 30 seconds inside the flight so you get the point like it's a dynamic and changing thing so it's not something that's just like oh i build something it's gonna no it has to be dynamically stable so it's like if something bad happens it's like i got this i can manage it it's not a put and forget kind of scenario now what are the requirements of uh, something like this now one thing you have to understand it's basically the primary structure of everything when you see a rocket you are seeing the fuel tank and everything that is bolted on is just bolted on the fuel tanks in very old design you could find something that had like you know independent uh, basically tube then there was tank inside but we realized very early on that's very wasteful so we started to utilize full tank as a primary architecture itself so where does the engine mount to, uh, mount to? fuel tank where does the cold gas thruster mount to fuel tank where does landing legs mount to fuel tank everything goes to through the fuel tank so fuel tank is the primary structure of the rocket another aspect is it must be chemically stable so whichever material you use inside them to make them it has to be chemically stable uh, as in it should not react with liquid oxygen it should not react with rp1 it should not react with methane or uh, hypergolic propellants that are being used those are really problematic but like whatever you are using it must be stable against that passively you cannot coat it you cannot paint it simply because that will consume way too much energy and mass to do so another aspect specifically for cryogenic systems is just uh, the tank material must be stable at cryogenic temperature so it must be temperature resistant to that point because there are many uh, metals that you can cool down to that temperature however most of them will lose structural integrity at that point basically you can shatter them with a like you know minor blow so that's not a no-go for something as violent as a rocket so that's what you have to do and Think of it this way, whenever engine engineers design rocket engine, it's always assumed the flow, basically the propellant flow that is going into engine, it's clean. It's not their job to figure out how the heck you're going to do that. They are just like, I'm assuming the flow is clean, only then I'm going to start my engine. So that's always the job of the fuel tank, uh, basically engineers, like make the fuel tank so it provides clean flow. It's the tank's job. If tank fails into doing so, for whatever reason, due to vibration, due to oscillation or things of that nature, it will be blamed on the uh, basically fuel tank system, not on the engine. Engine. engine is supposed to assumes and expecting to run 100% liquid flow. It cannot have quote unquote voids, it cannot have quote unquote gas pockets. Those will instantaneously destroy the rocket engine, specifically starting with turbo engines. So that's another aspect and all these things generally are done under pressure specifically for liquid to make sure that flow rate is GD enough. Uh, we generally pressurize it. Sometimes we pressurize with helium, sometimes using hot propellant itself. So liquid oxygen that will be heated up, turned into the uh, gaseous oxygen that will be fed back to the tank to pressurize it. Because again, you have to understand you started uh, like this giant tank. It was full to almost 100% and helium, how many, how much helium you can handle. So you can barely have helium, let's say by 25% it can provide, let's say 5 PS, uh, 5 PSI, why I'm saying legacy uh, 20 30 psi on the fluid the moment it starts to go down then the helium is not enough so that's why we have to feed back system uh, basically we feeding uh, hot oxygen feeding hot uh, methane into the methane system these there are subsystems to make sure the pressure is there now consequence of that 
this tank has to do everything about a rocket while being under pressure so it's almost uh, like you know almost at a breaking point and you have to now do the most difficult task do everything while has to be as light as possible because technically a submarine hull can like broke please i can do that in my sleep but reality a submarine hull is multi million ton so you not one million ton but you get the point like it's those are very heavy things you have to make this puppy as light as possible that what's make this complicated like basically where does the most uh, amount of engineering time goes into this now what materials we can utilize to achieve this almost impossible task thankfully because of the long requirement list there are only few practical uh, cases that you can try to make it out of anything you want is just like it will be only practical with few things and uh, two independent aspect that you have to analyze that is manufacturing complexity could be a limiting factor so you may find like hey this material is super gg super awesome it does everything i wanted to do but it's like it takes too goddamn long to make or the machines required to manufacture this puppy is too expensive prohibitive or like complicated as hell you may be like yeah i will not use that another time cost of the core component itself so think of it this way uh, you may find a robot that makes a carbon fiber shells so very easily but carbon fiber uh, basically that thread itself may be super expensive then you will back to square one so these two things are very critical aspect it's like how complex it is to manufacture and uh, basically cost of the core components now there are three primary things that we utilize there are other things but three are the primary major things first is aluminum lithium alloy most of the time that's what you are saying and then we have uh, different stainless steel now these are very common in old systems and newer systems simply because people are realizing the bigger the rocket you make the easier it is to deal with steel and steel has advantage of being super cheap core component wise super cheap and super cheap to assemble and manufacture think of this way like starship is being actually built in out in open and they only have to shield that place just so wind does not bother with uh, with it so you get the point it's like fundamentally super easy in terms of complexity and there are carbon fiber composite but most people are realizing that it's just not worth the cost because you if you remember your mathematics uh, very well specifically any mathematics you studied before standard 10 that is surface and volume they have a disproportionate response to each other basically you make the basically your diameter uh, square basically you uh, increase the diameter a little bit your diameter basically how much surface area is that will go up by square that's a bad thing that that means you have to use a lot of mass here's the interesting part the volume inside it basically how much propellant you can pack inside will go up by q that's why every tom dick and harry wants to make a big rockets and that's why falcon 9 is so goddamn skinny uh, because they had a problem that ideally falcon 9 if you want to rebuild it you will always make it much fatter and it would simplify hundreds of issue but consequence of that that would make it very difficult to transport through road and spacex was all about cost cutting in the early days so they are like no nope, we have to make it as thin as possible so we can uh, transport using road normally now what the first thing they do once they have enough manufacturing capacity make the rocket fat that's the whole point that's why rocket is getting fat now again there is a limit like how fat can you make it it's like don't actually expect to make something that is like you know diameter of 30 meters or 50 meters is like yeah the mathematics will still apply it just will become too unwieldy to actually utilize it so there is a limit to that but you get the point you never want thin and skinny rocket like falcon 9 you always want fat boy like uh, basically saturn 5 as long as you can afford it let's talk about inside of a fuel tank now you may think okay i have figured out the material i have figured out the diameter and all that jazz uh, i'm going to make the tank is that is it done well no simply because sloshing liquids are very dangerous for example think of it this way railway tankers in early days they simply made a tank and because trains were not very fast nobody was thinking about it once train became fast enough and the moment train was like okay i was traveling at good speed now i have to apply brake train refused to apply brake simply because the liquid hitting the basically chamber wall and uh, basically imparted enough momentum that it basically kept the train uh, you know going or worst case is derailing and that happens with everything basically that has a liquid for example aircraft tanks especially big ones uh, dealing with uh, when you are talking about fire trucks that has a like serious mitigation they have to employ otherwise uh, when the fire trucks going to take a corner at high speed yeah the fire truck will have fire of its own so, so you get the point sloshing liquids are very dangerous so how do we manage it we utilize internal buffers now these baffles are basically structures that uh, quote and quote dissipate the shock basically rather than having one continuous liquid mass that is going bang bang in your rocket it's just like it dissipates it it applies a like you know gentle breeze now the reason for that is basically think of this way if you did not had this and you fire your main rocket engine everything will work fine in the uh, first fuel because once it actually fuel tank uh, fuel tank is full 
it's safe actually because there is not enough sp- uh, space to build up momentum the moment you reach to a point let's say uh, one third or basically half of the fuel tank is empty at this point you are at risk of sloshing not in the beginning but at the middle point where it's like it can slosh and it can build, uh, build up enough momentum that it a it could choke up the engine b it could destroy the guidance system because again gimbal will try to fight it but how the heck it's gonna fight it because every time it's gonna fight it it's gonna amplify the effect and boom your rocket goes boom so fundamentally we learned the hard way that we have to have baffles these things dissipate the shock basically and never let a uh, liquid to become into one large volume it's like always like small pockets it's like small pocket liquid not a danger large pocket that's a tsunami so you want to make sure there is always small pockets and the best example would be saturn 5 systems they have huge tanks now in those huge tanks they had huge baffles just to make sure in worst case because again these things are massive and when they're firing at like full thrust that's a lot of energy, a lot of vibration. And liquid at that space, especially when you're turning or doing anything like that, liquid could uh, say, you know what, I don't want to turn with you. Bad things could happen. So baffles are necessary. And I would suggest you to watch videos that I provided down below uh, in which uh, basically uh, this crowdfunding system, they are showing how the heck they are developing their baffle system and how they are doing the testing. And it's a very important thing, like slosh reduction is compulsory. It's not optional, compulsory. If you do not have that, your rocket goes boom. Another aspect it, once you are talking about, once you are in space, you may uh, be in a position where you're like, hey, I want to restart the engine. And then it's a game over because at zero gravity kind of scenario, uh, fluids no longer know which way is up, which way is up or down, front or back. It's just going yellow. At this point in time, fluid becomes what we call sticky. Uh, and you can see that in uh, videos from ISS. Basically, when uh, astronaut squeezes the towel, water comes out, but it does not go anywhere. It's like acting like a glue. It's basically sticking to itself. Now to Thankfully, we can utilize that to what we call surface tension to make devices that are like veins and uh, quote unquote metal foam that allows us to channel the fluid fluid using fluid dynamics you are not utilizing any energy you are just utilizing surface tension now these are compulsory for satellites because satellites will be in, a, in an environment in zero g for months so any residual energy they had they would have been dissipated and if they have to start the engine and the fluid is like i'm not going to go to engine bad things will happen so that's how we solve these things first we ha- apply baffles then at the bottom you always have uh, what we call veins these veins make sure at least some fuel goes into the engine because you have to understand that even if a le- little bit fuel goes through and engine starts and it provides thrust everything has a directionality now at that point in time problem solved but you have to make sure that initial start happens without void to achieve that you have what we call basically veins and metal foams and those foams are just like uh, basically metal mesh with a lot of holes so that has enough uh, surface area to grab onto quote unquote enough propellant that is like I'm going to start the engine without any issue. Like it, it guarantees that the engine will start without any issue and it will run long enough to have a directionality of fuel. So the moment of uh, quote unquote fuel f- falls back, everything is okay. It's just these things make sure that in zero G scenario, especially in second stage, when you have to restart the in- uh, booster system without this, good luck. That's not going to happen. Now, all these things happen inside the tank. So it's just not a tank. A lot of these things also happen. Then we come to the outside of it because you have to understand the dynamic forces that are applying here you may run up in a scenario where surface tension is not enough you may run up in a scenario where basically baffles are just uh, not gonna do anything heck may hinder your performance in some scenario so you're like how the heck you manage that like if you reach in what we call boundary condition basically falcon 9 going like this and then trying to turn backwards how the heck you're gonna do or what if your rocket is too huge and the engines are demanding so much fuel that surface tension does not allow you to hold enough fuel how the heck you're gonna start your rocket engine back then and you are already in zero g what the heck you're gonna do basically saturn 5 stage 3 how the heck you're gonna solve that solution utilize external help outside help at that point in time you have to push the rocket and little bit of push will do that job How the heck you push it, that's up to you, but little push will do the job. So you have to understand, all you have to do is start the engine. You don't have to keep it running. The moment you start the engine, there is enough backwards force that it becomes a self-sustaining reaction. You don't have to think about it. So generally in Falcon 9 cases, coal gas thruster provides enough push. That's just like, okay, propellant starts to go. And the moment propellant goes, the engine is like, I got this done no problem with that and uh, sometimes springs are also used basically when you are talking about small rockets they are stage separation they are just pushing each other and falcon 9 also does that for second stage and if you pay attention to the no- uh, basically plunger that is in the engine nozzle it's pushing it like pay attention to next time when you watch a live stream it's actually pushing it it's just like throws it benefit second stage gg it's like it has directionality everything is awesome for it Side effect, the first stage is like, bro, what the hell? Action equals reaction, so it's going in opposite direction. So its fuel, ends up, instead of being in the side of the engine bay, ends up in the front nose cone. 
thankfully it has uh, basically cold gas thruster otherwise it would be stuck in that scenario so that's how we utilize or sometimes if you are talking about big rockets like uh, saturn 5 you will utilize completely independent solid rocket motor just to do that mm -hmm. like and there are amazing videos of this puppy when they are firing it and there was a camera on board of second stage looking at the third stage when they separate out and you will notice the three jets are coming out what are those there those are the jets from this solid motor solid motor will work in space without any issue and they fired it and that fired long enough a to do the separation b once they fired enough it is applying enough oomph that all the propellant is going back and once propellant is there rocket is like uh, detect thrust that means propellant is back sensor starts to like so green engine is like I, I, I have clean signal i'm gonna go and the moment engine goes done no problem after that so that's the whole point you have to understand once the engine is on all your worries goes away if engine is not on then you are in issue <laughs> so these are the things that go into the quote and code just a fuel tank so this was my presentation about uh, propellant tanks of rockets. I hope you liked it, learn from it. In that case, please click the like button, share it amongst your friends, that will help me a lot. And please do watch the videos that I provided down below. And if you didn't like it, didn't enjoy it, I urge you to press dislike, press it twice to show me extra disappointment, and please leave a comment because I try to reply to all of them. Subscribe, press the bell icon if you're free, and as always, thanks for watching.